148th episode of the Atlas Society Asks. My name is Jennifer Anju Grossman. My friends call me JAG. I'm the CEO of the Atlas Society. We are the leading nonprofit introducing young people to the ideas of Ayn Rand in creative ways, including animated videos and graphic novels. Today, we are joined by Larry Correa. Before I even begin to introduce our guest, I want to remind all of you who are watching us on Zoom, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, you can use the comment section to type in your questions. Go ahead, get started, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Our guest, Larry Correa, is a multiple award-winning, nationally best-selling novelist and popular blogger who often writes on issues involving the Second Amendment, uh, gun laws, self-defense for uh, national publications. His famous essay, An Opinion on Gun Control, was a viral internet sensation with over a million reads. His latest book, In Defense of the Second Amendment, uh, he hits hard on why gun-free zones are more dangerous for law-abiding citizens, why so-called red flag laws don't work and can be easily abused, how we can return to a society that has a safe and healthy relationship with guns and more. Larry, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on. I, I appreciate it. So I'd like to start by asking our guests their origin stories. And yours is quite unusual. Growing up on a working dairy for, farm, becoming a Mormon missionary, opening a gun store, teaching firearms. It doesn't sound like the backstory of a best-selling science fiction uh, fantasy writer. So uh, how did your experiences propel you on your current path? Um, yeah, I had, I have a different, ba uh, different background, I guess, than most people who wind up in writers, but I grew up in El Nido, California, which is a very poor farming area. Uh, my family were Portuguese, uh, my, uh, uh, Portuguese immigrants. My dad was born here. Uh, we, uh, we're dairy farmers. That's what we did growing up. I did that for many years. I did that later on for other people too. I, I worked on, uh, did, I, I did a lot of stuff with cows, uh, that will develop a certain, uh, rough and tumble mindset, I guess, and also a, a unique perspective on what it means to have a work ethic. Um, I went to college in Utah. I, like I said, I was a missionary. I did that uh, for two years. I loved that. That was a lot of fun. Uh, great experience. I uh, graduated from Utah State with a degree in accounting. I became an accountant. I went to work for very businesses. I wound up in the gun business because I've always been a gun guy. I've always <clears throat> been passionate about the Second Amendment and firearms. I I wound up uh, as a machine gun dealer. <laughs> I owned a machine gun store. I uh, I did that for many years. I was a concealed weapons instructor. I was a rifle, pistol, and shotgun instructor. Uh, I I did a little bit of activism at the state level. Um, was involved in some gun rights activism, that kind of thing. Uh, this entire time, I was a novelist as well as I was trying to make it as a novelist. I've always been a, a wannabe writer. Uh, during this time period, I wrote my first book, Monster Hunter International, which uh, I self-published after getting rejected by literally everything in Manhattan publishing. Um, it blew up huge. It uh, was a huge hit. And it, I picked up a publishing contract and I've been a writer ever since. I, uh, in the meantime, I also, I was, uh, I was a military contract accountant. I did uh, that kind of thing for many years before I was a full-time author. And uh, I have now written, I believe, 26 or 27 books, a uh, whole bunch of coll or four collections now, short fiction, four anthologies I've edited. And uh, in defense of the Second Amendment, it's my very first uh, nonfiction project that I've ever done. And uh, it's it's been a wild ride. <laughs> I, I am married I uh, for, for 25 years now. I've got four kids, uh, three of whom are adults. And so that's, that's odd. <laughs> <laughs> they, they get old on you and so that, that's pretty much me and what I do I just uh, I just write books now and um, chime in with a lot of controversial opinions on various things I'm in an industry that is uh, overwhelmingly not liberty-minded uh, the publishing industry is based out of Manhattan and uh, is overwhelmingly uh, kind of authoritarian in, in nature right now and so people who go against that are, are considered oddities. And I, I, uh, 
so I've kind of made a name for myself as being the guy who bucks those trends. And uh, I have a great, great career and thoroughly love what I do. Uh, any literary influences along the way? A lot of writers are also huge readers. Um, so I don't know if there were science fiction writers that influenced you. And of course, the obligatory question, did you read any Ayn Rand along the way? Yeah, actually, so uh, I did read Ayn Rand in college. Uh, it was, was the first time I read uh, both Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged. And as a young man who has issues with authority, uh, they were very pivotal. They were very pivotal books for me, uh, especially say being a, a gun rights guy. A lot of that uh, definitely uh, came over in my philosophy. And also growing up on a farm, you come away with a very uh, distrusting nature as far as the government and the promises which they make you. <laughs> and so there was that. So, yes, there was definitely some influences there, especially in my in my early 20s. Um, a big pivotal author is honestly for me, if I had to pin it down to a few, because I, I did read a lot uh, when I was young, would be Louis L'Amour, uh, the, the famous Western author. I read a uh, hundred of his books, literally a hundred of them, if not more. And um, probably Robert E. Howard, uh, the creator of Conan, Solomon Cain, uh, Bran Mac Morn. Uh, that was kind of, those two authors, I would say, were the biggest influences on me stylistically. Uh, and probably philosophically in, in my youth. And then I ever, I've read everything else I can get my hands on. I, uh, I was a voracious reader most of my life. Once you become an author, unfortunately, it kills a lot of your reading time. Uh, so I don't read as much now just because of the nature of the beast. I, I read a book now and my brain starts to edit it, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge reader and uh, uh, thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy reading different things from various genres and eras. And I try not to limit myself to just one kind of thing. I like to bounce around. So uh, we, we talked a little bit about the story behind Monster Hunter International, which I'm also thoroughly enjoying. Um, are there some kind of autobiographical elements or? <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> there are some. And so where that came from originally was, uh, I was uh, back in the early days of the internet forums. Um, I, was a, I was a young guy involved in some different internet gun forums and we were making jokes one day about lines we'd like to hear in a horror movie and basically the, the idea was horror movies which i enjoy um would be really really short if they start our people <laughs> if they start you know gun nuts and and you know liberty-minded people who take care of themselves versus most horror movies are people who just kind of like scream and run and get eaten and so my very first published novel was based on that idea i was like okay i'm going to take my people and also one of the things we do in it is um uh it monster hunting is a for-profit uh business it, it is um in fact we compare it often to the government so, so we get a little randy mm -hmm. and philosophical you can see how this <laughs> in fact we uh my monster hunters are devout capitalists who get paid to handle monster problems and, uh, and handsomely <laughs> yeah that's their career and uh, so it's monster hunting for fun and profit, and that's their, their job, and they treat it as a job, they treat it as such, and they often butt heads with the, um, the official uh, uh, control, free, control freak authoritarian style of monster control, because uh, in the books I set it up so the, monster, the existence of monsters must be kept secret, and so we have kind of the two competing schools of private versus public. And uh, how how they're how they're handled, and that's kind of a theme that's been in the series uh, for for forever now. We're at that that series we're now up to with the spinoffs and the um, anthologies. I think we're up to now twelve books. With uh, it'll be thirteen this year. Uh, so that's that's been a very popular one. Wow! How many books do you come out with? I mean, what's your pace? Is it uh, About a couple of books? About two a year. Uh, I've done I've done three a year at times. I've done one a year at time. My average comes out to about two and a half a year is what I do, and I've done that now for um, uh, about thirteen years, which is kind of crazy. I think fifteen years ago is when my very first self published book first came out. So, and then I still had a few years after that where I still had a job, like a regular normal person job, and I did uh, uh, defense contracting. And uh, then after that, I, I went full time. And so every time I've, since I've been a full time writer, it's been about two and a half, three books a year. Now, we talked a little bit about the New York publishing scene, and I would certainly 
assume uh, that the literary scene is uh, more authoritarian, um, not not uh, open to uh, liberty minded themes, but I might have thought that sort of sci fi and uh, fantasy that that would have had a different ethos. Perhaps I'm just thinking of you know Heinlein's fiction and and other um, writers from that uh, from that sort of uh, side of the ideological fence. So um, was that a surprise to you, or is, is sci fi uh, more um, kind of open to a diversity of views or? It, well, what it comes down to is the authors are actually as diverse as the rest of America. Uh, at the same time, you have a lot of collectivist authors and, and socialists and um, uh, various things of that nature. You also have a lot of you know pro-freedom, liberty-minded individuals writing. I mean, we have Republicans and Democrats and so forth. It's, it's broken down like the bell curve of America. The problem is the actual industry itself, the publishing mm. industry is going to be 99 point something Democrat. Um, and it, once again, it's a very Manhattan based industry. Um, my publisher is out of North Carolina. <laughs> and so, so a little bit different there. And that's one reason I get away with doing what I do. Um, so the authors are actually kind of all over the board. The problem is for a long time, the authors kind of had to stay silent because the powers that be would kind of enforce a rigid group think where if you were an individualist and you went against that, you kind of rock the boat. They didn't like that. They would sabotage your career. Uh, we have hundreds of examples of authors getting blackballed uh, basically and their careers being damaged because they went against uh, kind of that Manhattan group think narrative and it would damage their careers. What really changed that a lot was the introduction of independent publishing uh, where people were able to just start go around the gatekeepers and bring their books directly to the market. Um, it's because we live in a, a world where, you know, the, it's, it's actually a fairly diverse group of views amongst the creators, but the gatekeepers are pretty much uniform lockstep, uh, like-minded, all go to the same parties, all went to the same colleges, all know each other, all got their jobs through basically nepotism and favoritism and so on and so forth. So it's become a very insular, cliquish kind of industry. Uh, so yeah, there are a lot of free thinking science fiction and fantasy authors out there who do kind of maintain that legacy of Heinlein. Um, mm -hmm. But for a long now, time, they were they had to stay quiet. And we're going to turn to your book uh, in defense of the Second Amendment. So everybody start typing in your questions and we're going to get to a few of those. But I, I wanted to... Uh, include one last thing that I saw you had started a campaign called Sad Puppies. Uh, I think perhaps in an effort to fight back against these, these sort of industry gatekeepers. Tell us what it was and uh, what was your vision? Oh, uh, so what happened was this about seven years ago. Um, at that point in time, my career had done well enough that I was um, safe. There wasn't really any way that anybody could damage me or blackball me because I had developed a pretty large and loyal fan base. Whereas a lot of writers who are conservative or libertarian uh, were kind of shunned into silence and they, they had to stay quiet on purpose. And so there was this big prestigious award uh, in uh, science fiction and fantasy publishing called the Hugo Award. And nice. being a former, yeah, being a former finance guy, I'm good at stats. And I was looking at how, how this shook out and who won it and how it was won. And I was stunned to see how small it was. What a small, tiny, insular group. And we looked at it basically for the last 250 something winners. Uh, there had been like 16 who had been something other than left wing. Um, so it was overwhelmingly very much uh, a monoculture. And I was like, you know, that's not, that's not right. And so I decided to get my fans involved directly. There's a bunch of people who had kind of like drifted away from traditional science fiction and fandom awards. And um, I decided to bring these people back. And I did with a vengeance. And so the first year I did it, where Sad Puppies, the name comes from, was you remember the Sarah McLaughlin video uh, where she was trying to get their show, the sad puppies, and they would play the sad music and try to get people to donate money to an animal shelter. So I did a spoof of that only involving writers. Uh, involving uh, non-left-wing novelists being, you know, and, and how this caused puppy sadness because we never got recognized for our work. And so I started bringing in all these fans, and we referred to them as wrong fans, having wrong fun. Uh, and we basically moved in, and we got a whole bunch of people uh, over the next couple of years. We got a whole bunch of people nominated for these prestigious awards 
that would normally have been despised and hated and shunned and blackballed. It caused so much controversy that even here, seven years later, I'm still getting hounded about this. Uh, and it's funny because everything I predicted about the the people that I was you know, kind of fighting against and trying to expose has come true. Um, everything I've, I've said about them has been demonstrated. And in fact, now the big convention, um, this is particularly ironic, the big convention that administers this, Worldcon, this year is being held in communist China. Wow. Um, the big world event is now is now controlled by the communist Chinese is being held in Chengdu, China this year um, to just give you an idea because once they, then, then all the people like me, all the libertarians and conservatives, they pretty much kicked us out after this and shunned us. And so they just like threw up a big wall around it. And once they did that, it, it just became even more insular and cliquish and political. And uh, now it's not based on merit or entertainment or storytelling at all. The whole thing is just a, a political political virtue signaling and posturing contest where whoever has the most victim points is given an award and then they give them to their friends. It's, it's, it's an absolutely fascinating thing to watch. Well, at some point we may need to just come up with a whole different award. And, oh, there's, uh, there's been a couple since that have, that have risen up because specifically because of what we did uh, to expose that. And uh, some of them are straight up popularity contests, just entirely decided by the fans. And uh, yeah. it's been it's been really it's been really great to actually have some competition. Uh, Absolutely. So- All right. Well, let's uh, turn to your book in defense of the Second Amendment. Obviously, you are a gun guy and you had gun stores and you did gun training, um, but uh, also wondering, is this just a book that you'd wanted to write for a long time? There are some other books um, about the subject. So what did you hope to bring to uh, the subject that was different? And um, was it a timing issue for you? Yeah, so this one is actually, um, uh, being a fiction author primarily, but I did nonfiction on the side, mostly through blog posts. Um, one of my editors, uh, one of my fiction editors took a new job at Regnery, this nonfiction publishing house. And in the wake of the Bruin Supreme Court decision uh, that was looming at the time, uh, this publishing house decided that they wanted to have a guidebook for Second Amendment history and activism uh, and getting people involved. And they, and they said, who do we know who is a first and foremost, a good writer uh, at at first, and then second, a gun person who knows all this stuff. Uh, and my fiction editor said, hey, I, my former fiction editor said, hey, I got a guy. <laughs> I know a guy. Uh, and they were a little leery at first because, like I said, I'm a science fiction and fantasy author, uh, not who you would think of to write a book that's got, you know, 15 pages of small print footnotes about law. <laughs> um, but I, uh, I went over and I did a pitch for them and I actually wrote this book in a very short amount of time um, because this is a subject that I've been passionate about for 30 years. Uh, It's interesting when you've been learning about a subject for 30 years, uh, you can basically write most of it in 30 days (laughs) because I've been doing research for a very long time. Um, And so so this was a passion project. This wasn't something I planned on doing before last year. It was just an opportunity fell in my lap. Um, I would have did it for free, honestly. Don't you know? I wouldn't spread that around, but <laughs> it's just something I feel so strongly in that I, I, I just kind of wanted to help, and I wanted to like get something out there that could move the needle on the debate, and arm the people who are already on my side with good facts, um, and also to kind of hopefully sway some of the people who were sitting on the fence. I, I, I didn't just go. A lot of, lot of, lot of pro gun books tend to go very factual and very logical and very. Um, non-emotional statistical which i can do but i'm a storyteller i'm a novelist and so the the tact i took is i i did it kind of like i was telling a story and i try to hit those emotional beats because the thing is uh the left is extremely good at preying upon people's emotions on certain topics except on the case of self-defense self-defense is a human right and that's a thing that people are emotional about in both directions. And for too long, we've kind of let the authoritarian side uh, claim the moral high ground, which they do not hold. That's a lie. And so I kind of tried to break through that. And so the book is very colloquial. 
uh, just kind of uh, personal. And uh, I think it's worked really well. And from the uh, from the reception, it does seem to be helping people out. So I'm I am I'm very happy about that. Let's uh, talk about that narrative, and perhaps we can start with the history of the gun control movement. Who were the earliest proponents, and what were their aims and arguments? Yeah, this is actually really interesting, and this is something that's been refocused on recently because of the recent Supreme Court decision demanding historical precedent as justification for gun control. And when you look at the historical precedent for gun control, it is all about uh, basically racism and classism. Um, it was all about keeping guns in the hands of the select and approved of society and disarming those who were seen as troublesome. Uh, and so the now when you have states like California and Illinois scrambling to justify their gun laws, then they're trying to find out, find historical analogs, early part of the of America's history. And what they're coming up with is laws that disarm the Indians, arms that disarm Catholic immigrants, uh, laws that say that um, freed slaves can't have weapons because they might be able to fight back when we're tormenting them. It was, it was things of that nature. And so the history of gun control is one of evil. It's, it's one of malicious control and weaponizing the power of the government to disarm people so that they could be victimized. Uh, and it hasn't changed. It really hasn't. They, they, they put different terms upon it. They, they, they put a, you know, it wears a pretty hat now. Uh, they try to claim to have the moral high ground because they care so hard, but it always comes down to the same thing. Uh, it's, yeah. it's, 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 a, it's, it's control. It's all about control. The guns are ancillary to it. If it wasn't guns, it would be speech. It would be religion. It would be business. It would be about personal uh, freedom. It would be about private property. Um, they're all interrelated. So in your book, you criticize the media for sensationalizing gun violence and ignoring defensive gun use. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, this is actually really fascinating, and I believe the media is directly complicit in this because they share the vision of uh, disarming people for the you know, greater good. And so they lie continually, and they manipulate. Well, they don't lie outright. They just manipulate. Uh, they're very selective in what they do report, and I include a lot of documentation from various people, including um, a professor of economics, John Lott, who's done some stupendous research into this. Where he goes in, he looks at news coverage, and what he discovered was like a 2,000, 2000 to 1, I believe is what the ratio was. If I can't, I, I'd have to check the actual stats, but it's an astronomical figure where, of how negative uses of guns in society are reported on versus positive. Um, so if you have a defensive shooting where uh, an innocent person uses a firearm to defend themselves against a criminal, the odds of that getting any national news coverage approaches zero. Um, it might get some local news coverage for a day or two and then vanish. Now, if you reverse that and a criminal uses a firearm to victimize innocent people, that will get nonstop coverage. And I even go into the book uh, a lot of examples of the coverage is how it's specifically manipulated to sell a narrative. If the identity of the bad guy in any case is helpful to the narrative they're trying to sell at the time, it'll get far more coverage. If the identity of the bad guy is bad for the narrative or goes against the narrative, then it vanishes from the coverage really fast. Um, every now and then there's a, a situation where there is something positive, there's a positive defensive use, and it will break through into the media. Usually that's because it goes viral through social media before they can step on it. Um, and, and I've got examples of that too. And when that happens, they scramble to try to find some way to spin it as being a negative. So when you look at the actual numbers and you look at the actual statistics as far as we can figure, and I, I, I include, I think, 24 different studies on this, the usage of guns defensively for people to defend their lives and property uh, are dramatically orders of magnitude higher than guns used to do the opposite, to take lives. Uh, yeah. 
it's, I, it's I absolutely was, fascinating. I was, I thought I knew something about the subject, um, but I was really surprised by the evidence you present. I'm going to turn to some audience questions, but first I just wanted to take a step back because you said that you also wrote the book uh, for people who were on the fence or who didn't know much about the subject. So maybe we could just take a break and talk about what are some of the most common misconceptions uh, about the Second Amendment that people have today. Yeah, that's that's actually a really interesting one. And that's actually what I, I closed the book on is trying to reach out to new people. And it's, the misconceptions are things like having a gun in the home is more likely to harm the homeowner than an intruder. That's just a lie. That's a, a fake study. But people believe it. Um, or you're just going to hurt yourself. And one that they aim at women, which is really kind of a, interesting because the, the they attack guns as being a misogynistic thing, yet guns are the ultimate equalizer. And if you look at the fastest growing demographic of gun ownership right now, it's, it is female gun owners. But what we saw for the longest time, it is like, well, if, you, if you're a woman and you have a gun to defend yourself, the bad guy is just going to take it away from you and use it against you, which is asinine. It's uh, blatantly untrue. Um, and so what we saw, especially in the year 2020, when we had the breakdown of law and order and we reversed uh, three decades of a lowering crime rate, uh, and we jumped back to 1993 level murders all within one year because, you know, just the breakdown of society there. Gun sales went through the roof. Um, the sales exploded. Um, if you look at the number of NICS checks across America, dramatic increase everywhere. Uh, and in fact, to the point where the supply chain was choked off and people were standing in line outside of gun stores to buy guns, whatever that gun store had at whatever they were willing to sell it for. Well, here's the thing. That wasn't my people doing that. That wasn't gun owners doing that. We don't pay over retail. <laughs> we pay, We never pay your MSRP. We've got ours. So what was happening was hundreds of thousands of new people were getting guns because for the first time in their lives, all these myths that they had been told that they had bought unquestioning the narrative that had swallowed was proven to be false. When they were told that, oh, just call 911 and the cops will come protect you. That's their job. Well, all of a sudden we had dozens of cities across America on fire and people would call 911 and be like, well, we can't come. Good luck. You're on your own. And those people were scrambling to buy guns because the first time in their lives, they were confronted with the idea that the state cannot protect you. And they came to the realization that this, that's a power that we delegated to the states and the idea that the state would do a job fairly, only they weren't. And so we have millions and millions of new gun owners across America. And so one of the groups of people I was really trying to reach out to with this book is, is those people to try to get them up to speed and try to get them to understand uh, where we come from and the arguments that we make and why we make them and what they can do to, to, to improve themselves and to improve their situations and to learn and to help their friends. So I have high hopes for the future because a lot of the myths of gun control have been crushed in recent years. Um, and that narrative that they've been selling has become an increasingly difficult lie to peddle. Well, uh, we love uh, an, op an optimistic view of the future, one grounded in reality. And uh, it sounds like that's what you're seeing. So uh, I'm going to turn to some of these questions first from Facebook. George Axelopoulos asks, while constitutional carry is becoming more widespread, do you think the automatic, automatic weapons ban is going to be harder to put down? Okay, that's an interesting one. Um... The NFA is something I do talk about in the book quite a bit, and it's been with us since 1934, and it's a terrible, terrible law. It doesn't make a lick of sense constitutionally, and there has been several blows against it in recent years uh, based upon two specific Supreme Court decisions. And where we're standing right now is there are two parts of the NFA which are currently under assault in court. Um, so it's going to be really, really interesting to see what the next few years hold. I wouldn't get excited about legal machine guns anytime soon. Um, I mean, it took us four years of nonstop court battles to get the whole bump stock ban, uh, to get some relief on that. 
Currently, right now, we're going through a battle over the pistol braces, which is part of the NFA, which is part of the same exact law that affects the machine guns. Part of the issue is that on the Supreme Court has recently ruled that if a weapon is useful and common, and in common use or useful for militia purposes, it is protected under the Second Amendment. It's a very difficult argument for the government to make that a full auto weapon is not useful for militia purposes when the single most common weapon issued to the military fits that criteria. It's kind of where we're at right now. That said, we are years off of this getting an actual court challenge. As far as Congress repealing that, barring some sort of unforeseen electoral miracle, I wouldn't you know get your hopes up on that. I mean, maybe if a meteor hits California, <laughs> I, I just don't, that's not going to be anytime that's soon. That's where I live. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. I mean, only wherever, this, wherever your congressmen and senators live. Um, I, I, I don't know what's going to happen on that. That said, I do expect or hope over the next decade to see a change on a couple parts of the NFA, specifically the short-drilled rifles and shotguns. Uh, because that's what's under uh, the question right now with the brace stock court cases. Uh, I'm sorry, bra uh, pistol brace court cases. And the other one I actually do expect to see um, some relief on hopefully in the next decade is um, uh, suppressors, uh, silencers, because that is also underneath there. And that's also an interesting thing. So I'm just waiting to see some court cases pick up, uh, pick up about that. And there are some states pushing back on that as well. Uh, and this is all actually related to the first part that uh, he mentioned was the uh, rise of constitutional carry. This is all interconnected. Um, we are now up to 26 states allow some form of constitutional carry. Uh, and that's going to be 27, I believe, here pretty soon. I think it was Nebraska state legislator just voted for it uh, today. So that's fantastic. That's over half the states now. When I got started in this, there was one constitutional carry state. I believe there were seven uh, may issue states or, or just seven shall issue states and, and a handful of may issue states and the vast and half the states were no carry. And so over 30 years, we've seen this just dramatic pendulum swing as more and more states have fought back against the federal government and more and more state legislators have found their spines and uh, stood up for their people. So that's a that's a hard one. I, I don't have my crystal ball. I'm, I, I, I am an optimist and I, I see good things. I would say if you really want to get rid of the NFA, support organizations, uh, support your local pro-gun organizations, support your national pro-gun organizations that are doing these lawsuits. Uh, things like SAF, uh, FPC, uh, GOA, uh, support those organizations that are out there filing those lawsuits on your behalf. That's your best bet. All right, we've got a question uh, from Instagram. Kirkland1983 asks, Larry, what do you think of 3D printed stocks and other gun parts uh, present to the conversation on gun policy? This is actually really interesting. I have a section in the book specifically about this um, because I believe overall, historically speaking, gun control as a means of actually disarming the populace is dead. They just don't understand it yet. Um, and it's a combination of not just 3D printing technology, uh, but also the increase in cheap, affordable, available home machining. Um, the, what, honestly, gun control was, as far as effectively disarming a population, was effectively dead when uh, Harbor Freight started bringing cheap drill presses in <laughs> to America. It's the kind of thing that no matter what laws they put in place now at this point to actually have gun control, no matter how draconian it is, somebody who really wants one can make one. And it used to be we could make some pretty rough stuff like that uh, from just parts from Home Depot. I mean, things like Sten guns, the Ludi, things like that. But we've actually gotten rather technologically refined now. So if somebody wishes to you know, break gun control laws and manufacture firearms, that is imminently doable. We're now to the point where we can rifle barrels at home. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. I, I actually, in the book, cite 
instances from around the world with countries that have gun control laws that are crazy by American standards, that Americans would literally revolt. Uh, they would not stand for this level of gun control in, in most of America. Yet those countries, we are seeing 3D printed guns and homemade guns being used. Uh, and in fact, I, I talk about the, the, the war in Burma. We actually have a lot of footage of actual combat in Burma where they are using uh, 3D printed 9 millimeter submachine guns. And wow. it's, yeah, it's, it's, and so yeah. it does actually change it a lot. I, it, I do think there's other areas as well where, you know, the advance of technology is opening up new spheres of freedom. And yet, you know, we can't just rely on that because the state is also continuing to advance as well. Um, but in terms of that international perspective, our friend, my modern Galt on Instagram asks, it seems like the UK still has a high degree of crime, even without guns. Larry, are there other examples where guns being made illegal made crime increase? Yeah, it's actually really interesting. I have a whole chapter on this because I find it so fascinating, the statistics. Um, part of the problem is when you compare crime stats from country to country, it's apples and oranges because most countries do not document their crime in the same way. Um, people, the narrative controlling media types understand this and they will cherry pick their support their narrative. When you delve into it, um, I'd like to say that America is like the 79th most dangerous country in the world, right? Um, that's, that's, that require, and I, I, I dug into these stats. That requires you to believe things like China has no murders. Uh, Sierra Leone is safer than America. Because <laughs> everybody lies. All these, every country lies. Uh, governments lie. Now, what we have seen in places like specifically England, Australia, uh, actually, a couple last last year in New Zealand, uh, where you have countries that will push through really draconian gun control in the name of public safety, and then the public doesn't get any safer. Some of these countries be like, well, we haven't had any mass shootings uh, since we passed gun control. The problem is most of those examples are using are countries that didn't have mass shootings before. We're talking mm. about a, a type of crime that is statistically extremely rare. Uh, even in America, they portray it as a common thing, but it's actually a statistical oddity. If there were no more mass shootings tomorrow, that would still leave like 99.7% of our murders. Um, they're, they're, they're not that big of a thing in the grand picture. So you have countries like England, they had, um, they had one mass shooting, they put through draconian gun control, and they said, well, we haven't had any mass shootings since. Well, you only had one before. Uh, Australia, same thing. Now, what we have seen in places like England and Australia, however, is a corresponding rise afterwards uh, of violent crime, some cases murder, oftentimes involving alternate weapons, because it's not really the question of the gun, it's a question of societal violence and how it manifests with whatever tools they have available. I mean, so you're way more likely to get stabbed. I mean, yeah, America, you get shot. We have guns. We have lots of guns everywhere. In England, they'll stab you. Australia, they'll beat you. Australia, I was actually fascinated to see just how high their um, their rate of sexual assault was. Uh, Australia's rate of sexual assault and um, rape was astronomically high by American standards. And so it's really interesting how they, they cherry pick the stats they want to use and they compare these things. Really, if you look at most of the world, too, even the places that do have the draconian gun control, the stuff they're trying to prevent, when a criminal puts his mind to it, it doesn't matter. And I have plenty of examples from the book from around the world, Europe, Asia, Africa, where civilian gun ownership is extremely limited or almost impossible, yet they still had those types of mass killing crimes, including some of the very worst in the world, uh, the highest. And it's funny because they always, in America, they always act like this is a uniquely American phenomenon. No, it's not. And I have hundreds of examples to prove that it's not. And in fact, statistically, it's not even that odd for us. And even in places, if you expand it outward to beyond just the tool used and you move it into things like bombs, poison, or uh, driving a truck down the street, uh, the rest of the world catches up with us. So, all right. Yeah. Well, what is uh, uniquely American, of course, is the Second Amendment and our tradition of gun ownership. 
Um, so when we're talking about some of these more draconian gun bans um, that have been implemented in other countries, perhaps the most extreme gun proposal here is a total ban on all private ownership of guns. Um, this was a really interesting section in the book. So I'd like you to speak to whether you think the federal government would either even try to pursue that uh, and what are some of the scenarios that you outlined in the book in terms of what you'd expect the response would be? Yeah, no, this is one, um, when I originally wrote that, that section was in response to Congressman Eric Swalwell, who is the dumbest man in Congress. <laughs> And Eric Swalwell one day was talking about how, you know, if we want to take your guns, we're just going to take your guns because the government has nukes. And what are you going to do about that? And that caused me to kind of go on a research spiral of the history of uh, armed rebellion and to provide dozens of examples of how he has no idea what he's talking about. And, and that is a nightmare scenario that I would I would pray that the government would never engage in. And I get into the logistics of it. I get into the numbers behind it and the stats and the challenges that that would face. Basically, to have nationwide gun confiscation in America, to like just round, because you always hear dumb politicians saying, round them all up. We're going to go door to door and take your guns. Okay. Ha. I get into the book and the number of gun owners and the number of guns we have in, in the country. And so that's first off, it's an astronomical undertaking. But let's say that, and the numbers I use in the book are 99.9% .9 of gun owners say, yeah, sure. Okay. I don't care. Take our guns. The number that remains, if only the most listless malcontents among us, you know, me and my friends uh, are the ones who resist you are looking at a number that is orders of magnitude larger than the number of insurgents that we fought at any given time in Iraq or Afghanistan over an area that's far larger. And I hate to break it to them, but it's not going to be that small of a percentage. Because once the government starts doing the atrocities necessary to round up Americans and strip them of their freedom and property and lives, um, other people aren't going to like that. And they always act like they're going to use these advanced weapon systems against the American people with impunity. Well, the thing is, they don't understand the Venn diagrams of the people who make up gun owners and the people who drive those systems, build those systems, maintain those systems. Uh, this, uh, I think in the book, I describe it as a stack of pancakes because we're one and the same. It's the same thing, too. They say cops will go door to door and take the guns. Well, there's only... I believe if you count federal agents and everything, there's like 800,000 law enforcement personnel in the United States of America. That is actually not a very large number, especially when, once again, you look at that Venn diagram, because half of those guys are going to be having to confiscate guns from themselves. Will some police and military go along with that kind of uh, unconstitutional order? Oh, yes, absolutely. Guaranteed. Look at the history of the world. There's always some parts of every organization but it's going to depend on regional philo uh, philosophy and where those people come from. There are going to be states in America where your number of law enforcement officers who would go along with that is going to be astronomically high. And they're probably going to be the same blue cities that we expect that kind of thing anyway. But you come out to a lot of rural red state America, your local sheriff's department is not going to go out and round up guns um, from us angry rednecks for 15 bucks an hour. Um, and one of the comments I had in there is like, if you think the Taliban was bad, wait till you fight Florida, man. <laughs> and this, <laughs> it's, it's crazy. And so honestly, yes. So is it possible that the government would ever push that hard, that fast and go for something of like that? Yes, it is because governments do stupid things. Uh, do I think it's likely? I don't, I don't know. I would hope not. Um, but once again, I don't have a crystal ball. I can't predict how dumb people can be. That said, if they do it, it is a nightmare. It is a national nightmare. It would be a crisis beyond all comprehension. Uh, I get into this in the book. This is probably the, the um, grimmest part of the book. When I talk about the true meaning of the Second Amendment, why we have it, and it being a kill switch on our church, um, it is the big red button um, that we don't want to push. And so you would hope and pray that, politicians wouldn't make us push the button. 
it, it, it was eye-opening uh, to say the least. And also I thought a, a really good primer for people who get the argument, well, we have the nukes and we have all of the advanced weaponry and are you gonna be you know, fighting us off with a, with a rifle? So um, now with about 15 minutes left, I definitely wanna make sure we don't uh, neglect to cover School shootings, um, been in the news a lot recently. So any commentary on some of the recent shootings and how they may illustrate some of the points that you've made in the book, perhaps about like uh, whether or not a perpetrator is of the narrative or not of the narrative. Um, and then of course, best and worst proposals for preventing or dealing with such shootings. Absolutely. This is one of the main things I talk about in the book, just because once again, this is statistically rare, but it's one of the bigger cultural issues. It's one of the bigger, more, uh, it, it's, it's the, it's an event that when it happens, it sucks all the oxygen out of the room. And even though 99% of the time we're talking about regular crime is what affects people. These events are such big, massive outliers. That's what people want to talk about. And that's also what the other side uses to push for gun control because they are so big and emotional. Uh, that said, what got me started in uh, gun rights activism uh, and testifying before uh, a state legislator in my home state was I was a concealed weapons instructor. And one of the things that I did was uh, in the aftermath of the Virginia Tech shooting, I started uh, a policy to teach anyone who was a college student uh, in my state, I would teach you for free. And if you were an employee of a school, I would teach you for free. The idea being that I wanted to get more people armed in these schools, because in my state, Utah, we actually had concealed carry in schools. Um, we don't have armed teachers per se, but a teacher can be armed. And what I mean by that is it's not a mandatory program. It's completely voluntary. But the way our law is set up here is that if a if an employee of a school wants to carry a firearm with a concealed weapons permit, they are allowed to do so at work. And that's the way the law works here. And that's how Utah has been for a very long time. Uh, we fought a lot of battles in the state legislature for this. That's what something I was involved in. And I was one of the guys that testified before about universities and college students to get the same thing. But over time, I started teaching all these people for free. And so I got to teach hundreds and hundreds of school employees. And I wasn't the only instructor in the state doing this. And so we had a lot of armed teachers in Utah. One of the things we discovered is every school in America has somebody willing to carry a gun. And what I get into in the book a lot, and it's not just schools, but it's any place where a mass shooting could happen. What stops mass shootings or any of these mass killings is a violent response. That violent response can either be an immediate violent response by somebody who is already there or very close, or it can be 5, 10, 15 minutes later. And what it always boils down to is in these events, the longer the bad actor has to act, the higher the number of casualties, period. Uh, I go into the book in great depth how if there is somebody nearby when the event starts, Odds are there's only two or three people hurt. If they have to wait for law enforcement to arrive, that number, the average number climbs up to about 12. And that's simple, it's a simple matter of math and logistics. So if you really want to stop um, school shootings, you need to make schools not gun free zones. I go into that in the book a lot. Gun free zones are where these events happen overwhelmingly. Um, it's really hard to pin down the actual statistics, but conservatively speaking, it's in the 90, high 90 percentile range. It's a gun-free zone. And in fact, even like we have the, talk about the narrative, there was a shooting in Kentucky uh, just what last week at the bank. And they were like, well, Kentucky's a uh, constitutional carry state. Look what good it did you. And then you delve into it. The bank was a gun-free zone. The employees at the bank were not allowed to carry guns. Um, we know for a fact that the, uh, the, sh uh, the shooter that, uh, that shot those kids in Tennessee right before that, because once again, these things tend to happen in clumps, too. I talk about that as well because it's media contagion. The shooter in Tennessee very specifically, and the, the, the police told us, 
that school that she attacked was not the initial target. The initial target was a different place, only it had too much security. So the new target was a place that had no security. It had no armed people. It's a very simple calculus. And people just need to wake up that evil exists and there are bad people in the world who want to hurt good people. Uh, their motives, their background, I mean, that's honestly, that doesn't matter. It's interchangeable. They're always going to go to the place where they can do the most harm without getting hurt themselves. The longer they have to work, the worse it's going to be. So my solution to school shootings, honestly, is simply uh, get the government out of the way let people carry guns at work if they work at schools. It's pretty straightforward. All right, uh, heading back to our audience questions. Um, Colin Neer from Twitter asks, how do conservatives keep letting the left get away with the statement that, quote, guns are the leading killer of children? Um, when the metric is for page, people ages three to 19, is that correct? Yeah, that's actually one of the that's one of the the little bits of sophistry they use to push the narrative. Uh, first off, the, they will manipulate the stats to pull out the very very young because if you leave in the stats of, of people who die uh, during complications after birth, that's actually a really high number. Uh, so they pull those out, and so they start you a little bit older, and then they run it up to like you know I, I was either it depends on the survey either nineteen year olds or all the way to twenty one year olds. And it's like the leading cause is getting shot. What they leave out, and they always make it sound like it's school, like little school children. Like you think it's like six or eight year olds getting shot. No, it's 16, 17, 18, 19 year olds getting shot. And whether they're getting shot, they're getting shot in places like Baltimore, Detroit, Chicago. And usually it's something gang related. It's gang and drug related. And that makes up the vast majority of America's violent crime. Now, I'm not going to get into, into like the socio-political reasons for crime, and I avoid that specifically in the book because it's a distraction of what I'm actually talking about. But the important thing to remember is that it's all about this narrative twisting. When they try to paint this picture, this emotional picture, that guns are what kill children. No, because they're trying to make it sound like these school shootings happen 300 times a year, and we saw they actually happen five times a year, maybe seven times a year depending on some year, I think the highest I could find in any given was, year was like 11 and the lowest was like two or three. But those are statistical anomalies, but they're trying to paint that as the norm. They don't want to say that most of America's gun crime is drug and gang related because that doesn't sell the narrative that they're trying to sell because that's the kind of crime that regular people want to get concealed weapons permits and own guns to defend themselves by or defend themselves from. <laughs> Um, so uh, that is definitely, and why do, now the, the first part of your question is why do, uh, why do we let them get away with that? Uh, I don't know. That's one of the reasons I'm, I do stuff like write this book and try to get this stuff out there and put the actual stats out there in front of people is in the hopes that uh, guys like you will take that and, and show that to your friends and tell people and spread the word. Uh, the big thing is we got to fight back. We got to push back. When when people lie to your face, you need to respond and say that that is not the truth. And the most part thing is not really responding to the liars. It's responding to the audience that's listening to the liars. Um, so it's up to all of us to get the word out. That's a very that was a very astute point that you made in the book. That you know a lot of times you're arguing with somebody who will never change their mind. They're committed to their narrative, but the way you engage in the debate not just with the facts that you're able to marshal, but also the way you conduct yourself in the debate um, is for those who are listening and those who are watching or those who are you know, online, uh, that's where you might have the chance to, to change people's minds. All right, I'm gonna take this one last one because it, it returns us to what we were talking about at the beginning, which is your, uh, your amazing fiction. Scott on YouTube asks, can you talk about your recent letter to epic fantasy readers that's gotten a lot of praise? <laughs> um, we have a we have a problem right now in the epic fantasy business. Uh, I, I do have one epic fantasy series where because of certain big name famous authors, specifically George R. R. Martin, uh, you know, Game of Thrones, very famous, and another fellow named Patrick Rothfuss, um, 
they both had big giant hit series that they started and they didn't finish them. And we've been waiting like 12 years, 15 years now for their last book to come out. Because of that, a big part of the market uh, is no longer willing to buy books from a series that aren't finished. And this is a genre that is based on having series, not standalone. That's just kind of like market expectations. And so we have a big part of the market because they got burned by Martin and Rothfuss are saying, well, we're not going to buy books until the series is done. Uh, well, I'm trying to point out to people, it's like, you need to get over that because if you love epic fantasy and you want to continue having epic fantasy, you need to take a gamble on purchasing products um, from these new writers, these young and upcoming writers, because otherwise they can't afford to keep working <laughs> if they don't have any income. Uh, they're not going to write you that five or seven book stories, the series that you're going to cherish forever and it's going to be your favorite thing. It's never going to exist because they can't do that. They can't take 10 years uh, with no return on investment. So most of it is a plea. Um, it was a plea to the market to please get over this. If you really love this thing and you want to see this thing continue, you guys need to, you need to actually invest in it because otherwise uh, guys like me are, we're getting old. Uh, we're getting older and we're going to age out and there's not going to be a generation of writers behind us to replace us because you starved them uh, in the years where they would have been learning and growing and getting better at this. Um, and so it's not about me. I'm doing fine. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm worried about the writers after me. All right. Well, we'll put a link to that, uh, that, that article in the chat. To close up, any other nonfiction books you'd like to tackle or new directions that you'd like to explore in, in fiction, what you might be working on right now? Um, currently right now I'm back to concentrating on my fiction because that is my bread and butter. Uh, that's primarily what I'm known for. Uh, I, I do try to hit a lot of the same, even though I, I, I'm a fiction writer and I'm an entertainment first, first and foremost, I do like to hit on those themes that are important to me and I believe are philosophically important to all of us. Uh, you know, I, I like to write about hope and heroism and good versus evil and, and people struggling and sacrificing and, and making the world a better place. Uh, and I really do love that. And I think, it, I think that's actually an important thing. Um, so right now I'm concentrating back and trying to catch up my fiction for the time that I took off to, to write the nonfiction. Are there other nonfiction projects I'd like to hit in the future? Uh, possibly, but right now I don't have anything official uh, that in mind. So right now I just need to get caught back up on the fiction. Well, that um, is yet another reason why we're extremely grateful that you took this hour out of your day to chat with us, to talk to us about the book. Everyone go out and buy it. The Audible version is also excellent. And Larry, what's the best way for us to keep track of you? A newsletter, website, social um, actually media feeds? My blog is monsterhunternation.com. And I actually have a newsletter there. You can sign up and put your email in there and it'll... Um, I, I don't spam the newsletter, so it's just mostly updates on when I have books coming out and that kind of thing. Um, I'm also on Twitter, uh, just look me up by my name, or I'm also on Facebook under my own name, Larry Korea. So um, I would I would I would say don't follow me on social media if you're easily offended by <laughs> casual profanity and politics. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Larry. Uh, this has been really terrific. Everyone, again, the book is in defense of the Second Amendment and, of course, his monster series. So go out and check that out. Um, thanks, all of you, for joining us today. If you enjoyed this video or any of our other materials, please consider making a tax-deductible donation to us at atlassociety.org. And please be sure to tune in next week when public speaking coach and objectivist Leopold Ajami will be our guest on the Atlas Society Asks.